This is PB. The programs you enjoy on WETA are made possible in part by grants from the Washington area Bowl America Centers, Kirkpatrick and Lockhart Attorneys, and Atlantic Research Corporation. You're watching viewer-supported public television, WETA Stereo 26, serving your community in suburban Maryland, Virginia, and the district. Tuesday evening operations are made possible by WETA members in partnership with the Annette and Theodore Lerner Family Foundation, committed to serving the educational, cultural, and civic needs of the Washington, D.C. metropolitan community. Good evening. Leading the news this Tuesday, Soviet President Gorbachev endorsed a separate Communist Party for the Russian Republic. A House committee voted out the anti-flag burning amendment without a recommendation, and eight companies were sued for polluting the California coast. We'll add the details in our news summary in a moment. Robin? After the news summary, Donald Trump's financial woes. We have a backgrounder from business correspondent Paul Salmon. Then we hear the views of experts on two major parts of the Trump empire, Lee Iskor on gambling and Abraham Wallach on real estate. Next, with the Soviet prison riot in the news, we have a documentary look at the Soviet prison system. Finally, essayist Jim Fisher on one Minnesota town's musical gift. Funding for the news hour has been provided by AT&T. AT&T has supported the McNeil Error News Hour since 1983 because quality information and quality communications is our idea of a good connection. AT&T, the right choice. And by the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, a catalyst for change. And by PepsiCo. And made possible by the financial support of viewers like you and the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Soviet President Gorbachev today offered a concession and issued a warning to his political rivals. The Soviet leader agreed to a proposal that would allow the Russian Federation, headed by Boris Yeltsin, to form its own Communist Party. He endorsed the proposal at a founding conference of the Republic's delegates. The Russian Federation is the largest of the Soviet Union's 15 republics. We have a report from Moscow by Tim Ewart of Independent Television News. The atmosphere seems friendly enough as Mikhail Gorbachev chatted to his arch-rival Boris Yeltsin. But the rift between conservatives and radicals may soon tear the Communist Party apart. Mr. Gorbachev did his best to head that off today. He told the radicals that the changes they want could cause the destruction of the party. And the hardliners that they had lost contact with reality. He also defended his own reform, declaring that perestroika had caused a huge turnaround in this giant country. But Mr. Gorbachev knows he's heading an increasingly weak and dispirited party. The session which began today is a dress rehearsal for the Soviet Party Congress, which begins in two weeks. The Russian delegates here will make up the majority of the delegates then. If Mr. Gorbachev can't reconcile the warring factions, if frustrated radicals form their own breakaway opposition group, he knows he'll be left heading a smaller, hardline party, which will enjoy little public support. A Soviet plane on a domestic flight was hijacked today, the second Soviet hijacking in 24 hours. A 22-year-old man threatened to blow the plane up, forcing it to land in Helsinki, Finland. He released all 60 people aboard and surrendered to the police about an hour later. No explosives were discovered. The hijacker was seeking political asylum in the United States. Jim? The gunman who killed eight people and himself yesterday may have killed two other people over the weekend. Jacksonville, Florida officials said James Edward Pugh used the same semi-automatic rifle in all the killings. They said the rifle may have been legally registered despite Pugh's conviction for manslaughter in the 1970s. Florida law prohibits the sale of firearms to convicted felons, but Pugh had completed his probation and no longer had a record. The House Judiciary Committee today voted to send the proposed constitutional amendment against flag desecration to the House floor without a recommendation for or against passage. The vote was 19 to 17, with five Democrats joining 14 Republicans to create the majority. Here's a sample of the debate that preceded the vote. This debate is over the strength 
and courage of elected officials to withstand the efforts to change the fabric of our nation, simply to punish a few individuals who offend us all by burning the U.S. flag. I'm confident that the American people can understand the principles at stake and see beyond the passion of the moment and to realize the true value of freedom of speech. The First Amendment has never been absolute. And it seems to me that the line ought to be drawn to protect the flag from burning and to allow United States attorneys and district attorneys around the country to prosecute people who cast contempt upon our country by burning the American flag for a criminal violation. The full House could vote on the amendment as early as this Thursday. It must pass by a two-thirds majority in both the House and Senate. A large anti-pollution suit was filed today in California. The federal and state governments charged eight companies with polluting the water and marine life around Los Angeles and Long Beach. The contamination with DDT and PCBs is alleged to have taken place since the 1940s. Under the federal Superfund law, the companies may be forced to pay millions of dollars to repair the damage. The drug and perjury trial of Washington, D.C. Mayor Marion Barry began today with opening arguments. Prosecutor Richard Roberts charged that the mayor used drugs while preaching against their use to his constituents. Barry's attorney, Kenneth Mundy, said the government had determined to get Marion Barry and went to any length to entrap him. Barry has pleaded in as innocent to all 14 counts against him. The Commerce Department reported today that housing starts fell in May to the lowest level since the 1982 recession. High mortgage rates and a sluggish economy were blamed. And that's it for the news summary tonight. Now it's on to the financial problems of Donald Trump, a report on prison riots in the Soviet Union, and a Jim Fisher essay. First tonight, can real estate magnate Donald Trump keep his financial empire afloat? On Friday, the developer missed a $73 million debt payment, but has a grace period lasting until next Tuesday before he's technically in default. There are reports today that Trump and his bankers may be near agreement to restructure his $2 billion debt load. The agreement would include an additional $60 million loan to help the Trump Organization meet payments on bank loans and bonds issued by Trump Castle, one of the casinos he owns in Atlantic City. We start our look at Trump's unusual problems with an unusual report by business correspondent Paul Salmon. Trump, the cash crunch. Could it really be happening to the symbol of business success in the roaring 80s? For years, it seemed, you couldn't open a newspaper or turn on a TV without seeing the face or the name. Trump the tower, Trump the casino, Trump the airline, Trump the author. Suddenly, a few weeks ago, the man whose life was a movable press conference was ducking the cameras. Donald Trump was facing a debt crisis, one that threatened his empire, or at least his lifestyle. What happened to the artist of the deal? We caught the Trump shuttle to New York and began to look for some answers. Right away, one thing became clear. Some of Trump's business maxims work better on paper than in the real world. For example, on page 176 it says, Good publicity is preferable to bad, but bad publicity is sometimes better than no publicity at all. Controversy, in short, sells. What better moment than now to ask if Trump had any second thoughts on the subject? But before we could ask him, we had to find him. Is uh, Mr. Trump here? No, he's not here today. Uh, but he does. He does show up on occasion. And he's more than willing to talk to you. This is the rest of us. Very danceable. Once again, PR and reality part company. In truth, we'd already been turned down for an interview. But we pressed on. Next stop, the legendary Plaza Hotel. Trump bought it in 1988 and spent millions to spruce it up. The doormen wouldn't let us in. But they absolutely assured us Trump wasn't inside anyway. One person who was outside was James Grant editor of Grant's Interest Rate Observer, and a longtime Trump watcher. It's a lovely hotel, as he says, maybe none finer. Uh, it doesn't pay the bills. What do you mean? The hotel has to do the very mundane thing of throwing off enough cash with which to pay interest on the loan that he got to buy it. And the arithmetic is not working here. It's not about style, it's not about imagination, or even about Mrs. Trump's taste. It's about 
interest, compound interest. And if, I guess if this were the only place that weren't doing it, it wouldn't be so bad, but uh, it's happening all at once to him. I mean, he is the Job of debtors. Trump the debtor. As he says on page one of his book, I like making deals, preferably big deals. The problem with big deals, however, is they usually mean big debts. While many of the older Trump properties, the Grand Hyatt Hotel, for example, or the Trump Tower, his headquarters, are generating enough income to cover their debt loads, it's a different story on some of the newer properties. The Plaza Hotel, for example. Trump spent lavishly to fix up the old landmark. Total investment, over $400 million. Grant says Trump was betting he could eventually sell it at an even higher price. The Plaza is all about going up, uh, like some common stock. So you buy this, you hope the market goes up, and then you sell it at a profit. That's right. You find a greater optimist, uh, which uh, Mr. Trump is now in the process of doing. The, the greater optimist, or looking at it negatively, the greater fool. One in the same, depending on the market cycle. What do you mean? Well, um, at the top or in the shank of, a, of an upturn, of an expansion, um, it's quite human to expect that it's going to go on forever because it, it feels so good. I mean, the papers read well, and uh, uh, even the city air smells sweeter. And then suddenly, without anyone issuing a press release, it all changes. And uh, the game is to somehow be in on that change before it happens. And apparently no one called Mr. Trump. Trump is filling more rooms than the old management did, and at a higher rate, about $250 a night. The interest payments, however, are $48 million a year, and even the higher revenues can't cover them. The problem's the same with the Trump shuttle. Business is reasonably good in spite of fierce competition from Pan Am, but here the interest bill is $42 million, and for all the cash the shuttle brings in, it hasn't shown a net profit yet because, like the plaza, its revenues are swallowed up by debt service. And then there's this prime 70-acre lot on Manhattan's west side. Donald Trump doesn't usually let the grass grow under his feet, but here at the West Side Railroad Yard, he's had no choice. Trump bought this land to put up a huge development, including the world's tallest building. He hasn't been able to get it off the ground. Meanwhile, since he bought the land with borrowed money, some $200 million, he's had whopping interest payments. $20 million a year, $2 million a month, $60,000 a day, just to hold on to the land. Someday, this land may be teeming with tenants happy to pay top dollar. And Trump could use the cash flow to pay the interest on the debt. But right now, there's no cash coming in while millions are going out. This heavy reliance on borrowed money, what business people call leverage, seems to contradict what Trump said in his book. I try not to have myself too exposed. Did Trump have an explanation? We continued our pursuit of him at the West Side Yards. Maybe he hasn't been here for quite some time. So Mr. Trump hasn't been around no, in a while? Uh, executives come here, you know, to look at the place. So where was he? It finally dawned on us. Trump had to be at the bank. Because if his bankers agreed to defer or reduce his interest payments, at least he'd have a little room to breathe. So we went to the headquarters of Citicorp. We didn't find Trump, but we did find Jim Grant again. Citicorp is one of Trump's biggest bankers. And uh, without Citicorp, uh, he couldn't have done what he did, whatever that was. In a very real sense, Trump owes both his, uh, his great empire and his troubles to his bankers, who were so willing to listen to him and so willing to do kind of unbankerly things. Uh, you might remember uh, the fellow you imagined as a banker before you had your first 20 or so credit cards. He was a guy very well practiced in the art of saying no. Well, the story of banking in the 80s, and of Trump's bankers in particular, was the refinement and the art of saying yes. They couldn't stop. They couldn't help themselves. So the bankers are trying to pay the bills by making risky and therefore high-yielding loans, and Trump is trying to pay the bills so he can pay his bankers. Um, everyone is crawling out on the limb of risk in some ways. Um, bankers are doing it their way, and Trump is doing it his. His way, of course, is to leverage up and speculate wildly. Check the book again, page five. Sometimes it pays to be a little wild. But when does it pay? In a rising market. When this book was written, being wild with debt made a speculator like Trump look like a genius. 
you put in, say, $10 million of your own, and the bank lends you another $90 million to buy a $100 million property. If the value of the project goes up, the extra value is yours. All you owe the bank is $90 million. With leverage, you do even better than the market as a whole. A related strategy was Trump's PR program. Again, in an up market, the more visible you are, the more positive attention you attract. Journalist Ned Schnurman studied the Trump style during the months he spent producing a TV documentary about Trump's career. And the Trump style is to demystify business to people, to make business seem like some wonderful everyday adventure. He talks to the, to the common man in a common man's language, and he talks in public that way. He never tries to make it complicated. At the same time, his, his real style is he could have invented the word leverage. You take a little pile of money here and pile a little bit more on there, and then you get credit to pile a little bit more on. I mean, he was a magnificent exponent of that. But more than that, exploiting openings, taking advantage of them, building credit on top of credit, and taking to the public the image of a common man who just knows how to do it. In general, Schnurman and others agree, the Trump strategy works. So long as the market keeps rising, the gambles keep paying off. But when the market turns down, as New York real estate has recently, being wild suddenly doesn't look so smart. Your $100 million property, for example, may now be worth only $40 million. You still owe the bank $90 million, so your stake is essentially worthless, and the lenders put on more and more pressure to be paid. Okay, if it's costing so much in interest to carry the empty lot on the west side, and the shuttle, and the plaza, and who knows what else, where's the money supposed to come from? Here sits the key to the Trump empire. His three Atlantic City casinos were supposed to be the cash cows, the can't-lose money makers that would cover the massive debt while his new acquisitions appreciated in value. But even the casinos were built on borrowed money. Trump financed them through junk bonds sold to private investors. The Trump Castle, for example, owes about $43 million in junk bond interest payments this year. Trump Plaza owes about $35 million. And neither is generating enough cash to cover even its own debt, much less to support the rest of the empire. Finally, there's the brand new Trump Taj Mahal which is flamboyant even by Trump standards. The Taj has an annual junk bond bill of 95 million. And already, only two months into operation, it's falling short. All this from the man who wrote on page 48, I've never gambled in my life. I prefer to own slot machines. It's a very good business being the house. Unless, of course, the house is built on debt. It seems to have been these casino losses that finally unnerved the bankers, forced them into new talks with Trump this month, and forced him to miss his junk bond payments last Friday. In fact, given that both the real estate market and the junk bond market have turned against him, Donald Trump, according to some observers, is lucky to still be in business at all. Gamblers know the importance of luck. Businessmen sometimes forget. Donald Trump, by playing the game of business with debt, other people's money, increased his risks and therefore his vulnerability to a run of bad luck. Now, you can't blame Trump for his current bad luck any more than you could credit him for his good luck in the past. But you could remind him of an economic truth he himself put in The Art of the Deal, page 328. You're always, says right here, at the mercy of the market. Joining us now are Abraham Wallach, Senior Vice President of First Capital Management, a real estate firm that owns and develops properties in New York, Washington, and Houston. And Lee Isker, a gaming analyst and First Vice President at Payne Weber. He joins us from public station WGBH in Boston. Mr. Wallach, at the mercy of the market, speaking as a real estate man, how much can Donald Trump blame his current troubles on the state of the real estate market? I think he can clearly blame part of his problems on the state of the market. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we've seen a great deal of overdevelopment, especially in New York City. Uh, in fact, New York City encouraged a great deal of development on the west side of office buildings, gave special incentives. Uh, during the uh, early part of the 80s, the city promoted a lot of residential development. In fact, I was thinking today that uh, Donald Trump was the last one to receive tax abatement on his Trump Tower, 
and after that the city passed a law that uh, precluded anyone from getting abatement. Uh, so that encouraged a lot of residential development prior to deadlines. So, uh, yes, he can blame market conditions to some extent, uh, but I think the reality is if you pay too much for properties and if your ego is as large as his wa is uh, and you just buy everything in sight, uh, part of the blame has to squarely rest in your own lap. We had an opportunity, for example, to purchase the Plaza Hotel and, in fact, made a bid on it. Uh, we were not successful, uh, and we were, when we were told what Donald Trump was prepared to pay and we were asked would we meet that price, we said it made absolutely no sense at a time when the market was moving up. Uh, you always have to recognize that markets turn, and uh, clearly market conditions are partially to blame, uh, but the other half of the blame uh, rests clearly in his lap. Mr. Isker, as an expert on the gaming industry, how much can Mr. Trump blame his, uh, his troubles today on uh, the state of that industry in Atlantic City? Well, he was the one who, of course, decided to go into Atlantic City. I mean, it's interesting to note that the, probably the two best operators in the industry, uh, Golden Nugget and Circus Circus, uh, both are not in Atlantic City. Golden Nugget was, and they got out, and Circus Circus elected never to come there. So, Where are um, they? Well, they're both in Nevada, in, in Las Vegas and in Laughlin, Nevada. And so, the significance of that is what? Well, the significance of that is that Atlantic City is not the most attractive gaming market. Um, it hasn't been for quite a while. The uh, overall profitability has been deteriorating. And he went in and continued to uh, make more and more investments in there while this was happening. And uh, you have to ask, uh, how come he didn't see this, or how come he didn't decide to pull back earlier? Okay, Mr. Wallach, um, the, he is now negotiating, we read in the papers, uh, with the banks who funded him so far for another $60 million loan. According to a lot of the interpretations put forward, for instance, in the Wall Street Journal, that isn't a loan to keep him in business as much as it's a loan to give the banks time for an orderly uh, sale or, uh, or uh, disposal of his properties. Uh, do you under So uh, instead of bankruptcy, which would be a disorderly sale of that, do you see the alternatives like that, that way now? Uh, I, would, I would have to agree. Initially, when we began to read about his problems, uh, I thought that uh, his efforts were merely an attempt to renegotiate a better deal, to spread out the interest payments, to get a few more dollars out of the bank, and that they would work with him. But now that we see the larger picture, three and a half billion dollars of debt, uh, properties that uh, in the near term have no chance of achieving the kinds of revenue necessary to cover debt, it becomes clearer and clearer that uh, the banks are posturing themselves uh, to give them time uh, to sell off the properties in an orderly fashion. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Mr. Iskor? Do you see the alternatives that way, bankruptcy or buying a little time for an orderly uh, disposal of the properties? Well, the thing is, I'm s it's still not perfectly clear how